So Cliff, here we are in this wonderful home of yours in Barbados. What a lovely place to have a little interview with you. Thank you so much for doing this for Brittany. But what brought you to Barbados originally? Well, I was offered a house here. They said, we're building new houses. Would you like one? And I said, well, not really. I hadn't thought of living in Barbados. And I said, in any way, if you're, if you're going to build a house on a beach, it's not for me. Barbados is full of British people. And you know, people like myself, I, I did stay down there once and people just kept walking by and going, and then they're going, it's here. <laughs> so I thought I couldn't live like that. So I saw this woman, and I, I, don't, I tried not to get eye contact, so I didn't. And I went, got my shirt, came back. I, I could see from that distance that she was still there. So I, I did this and then I saw this. So I looked and she's calling me over to her table. And so I go over and, and I'm already thinking to myself, I'm not gonna, I'm not admitting to anything. She said, I, I know who you are. I said, who am I? She said, you're Cliff Richard. I went, no, I'm not. She said, of course you are. I said, of course I'm not. She said, you are. I said, I'm not. She said, I have followed you the whole of my life. I know who you are. You are Cliff Richard. So I gave it and said, yes, I am. She said, you're not, are you? <laughs> <laughs> It's so funny, isn't it? You know, at the point where everyone's sort of worrying about work, you haven't stopped. You've just released your new album, Music, The Air That I Breathe, and that has immediately gone into the top five, which actually creates this incredible record that you have had top five albums for the past eight decades. <laughs> it's remarkable. And maybe that's why, I mean, how could a 17-year-old when I when I made Move It, I was 17. I would never have sat there thinking, eight decades from now, I'm gonna have an album in the top five. You can't plan a thing like that, yeah. it just happens. I don't think anybody else is gonna be able to achieve that. My first record was released on, on, on mono, but you know, also available on stereo. And it got to number two on my, uh, just a few days after my, uh, my 18th birthday. But the tastes, you know, your tastes tend to be the same. And I've always felt that you can actually, you don't have to jump on anybody's bandwagon, but there's nothing to stop you from running alongside. So I've been, I've, I feel I've been influenced by almost everything that's, uh, that's taken place. Yes, I have my favorite things. People ask me now, uh, can you relate to uh, the new, uh, today's music? Yeah. I went, yeah, I can, but I don't always relate to the songs. And I think maybe that's part of being Born when I was born and starting when Elvis and Ricky Nelson and Buddy Holly and Chuck Berry, they were rockers, but they sang songs and, uh, and it stuck with me. I still prefer a record that I hear that has a lyric and a good melody. Right. You've <laughs> written your autobiography, The Dreamer. Yes, I mean, I, I had a book written out a few years ago called uh, My Life, My Way. And then of course I went through this terrible time with the BBC and the South Yorkshire Police, a false accusation and it was a disastrous period. Yeah, I, I understand. And during that time, I was going to do an extra chapter for the previous book. And then of course this all happened and we thought, well, we, we just can't do anything at all. So I cut out of everything, I didn't do much at all. And then when it, the idea came up to do a new book, I was speaking with Ian Gitten, who's the co-writer with me. I couldn't have done it without him actually. But he talk, came and talked with me for four or five days in Portugal, day from morning to night. And I was actually quite shocked at what I'd done. So even though I wrote the book, you know, it's all my words and my thoughts. There were certain areas that I needed help. I needed people to tell me, what was that album called yeah. 500 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> so they were absolutely part of the team as far as I'm concerned. And it was good fun to do it. It was actually terrific to read the audio version myself. Right. That was, it was, and there were two or three moments when, the, again, because I was uh, quarantining in England, the, the producer of the, o o the audio version was zoomed into me. And there were two or three times and he said, take a deep breath, stop. I can see you're having, getting a little emotional. I said, yes, I am. I was talking about my dad. I was talking about police, whatever it was. And, uh, it was nevertheless, though, quite fantastic to articulate 
what we'd already written. It's yeah. very right. strange. I can't understand why yeah. it felt so different. Yeah. You've just brought up the South Yorkshire Police and the BBC. What helped you get through that entire situation? Was it your faith? Well, from the beginning, when they bro broke into the apartment, well, they didn't break into it. I, I got a message saying the police were at my apartment and that they had a warrant to let them in. I said, well, please let them in, because if you don't let them in, they have every right to smash the door down. So they're not gonna find anything. And at that stage, of course, I didn't know what it was about. I had no idea that someone had made this false accusation yeah. about me. So uh, it, it was um, a very, very strange, and it was emotionally traumatic. And it was just absolutely a, a period I wouldn't want to wish on my worst enemy. It was terrible. But I got through it because suddenly I realized, I kept getting messages from people saying, I work in an office block in London. Nobody in our office block believes a word of what they're saying. Then I, I went, I strolled down towards my gate once because I thought it's funny as it got slabs of gold paint on it. And I got down there and it was yellow ribbons. And each one of them had a little, we love you, Cliff. Don't believe a word. We're right oh. behind you. And of course, I had friends that came and played tennis with me. They came. Some of them came and stayed with me. We laughed. But in the end, Nigel, what happens is that the days go by pretty well. And then you go to bed. I never, for some reason, in the book, it came up a lot. I think I'm, I should see a psychiatrist because I woke up and it was always 3.15. For the life of me, that that... That time doesn't mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. But once I started at that point, I seemed to wake up every day, every night at 3.15. And it just meant that for four years, I probably got an average of about three and a half hours, three, three hours sleep. It was, it was not good for me. And when I saw myself on television coming out of the, out of the, um, the court, when, when I had won the case, I mean, and I had no, I had no desire to punch the air. Gloria Hunniford was sitting behind me that, that day, and she said, I was so, so shocked, she said, I thought once you heard the news, you'd be like tennis players. And I said, all I felt was washed in relief. It was finally over. So I got by, I mean, I, I, I spoke with God a lot. I think I became more spiritual. Your faith spiritual. must have helped. Huh? Yeah, my faith does everything for me nowadays, but I did feel that I grew in my spirituality because you know, in the end, who was else to talk to at night? <laughs> so it was a it was a great learning process. But it's, I'm past it now. I want everyone to know that I'm past it. I'm happy. <laughs> I've, I've got rid of the gaunt look. I yeah. mean, that I had when I came out of the court. And uh, but I can't get over it. You know, I'll never get over yeah. it. But past it, I am. After nearly sixty years now, you are returning to Desert Island Discs. <laughs> and how is your taste changed in that period of time? Do you remember what you originally asked for? And what uh, you know? Well, I know that I asked for uh, Elvis Presley, uh, the Heartbreak Hotel, when my two mates, who were, we were a little trio band together, when we heard that coming out of a car window in Waltham Cross Hertfordshire, it changed my life. We all agreed that we, we, the guy drove off, so we never knew who it was or what it was called. One of the guys, the guy that played guitar with me, Two days later, we'd had no phones in those days, of course. He, we met at my place and he said, I know who it is and I know what it is. And he said, his name is Elvis Presley. And we went, Elvis? Who's got a name like Elvis? We'd never <laughs> heard it. <laughs> That's a given. And then they said Heartbreak Hotel. But for me, you know, Nigel, it seems to me from that moment, I was focused. I, I wanted to do it. I had not a problem with my father, but he was very balanced. My mother was right behind me. My dad would say, don't forget. If you, nothing happens, you still got a life. You can still have a life, mm -hmm. and I've, I remember those words. And when my, when I'd made Move It, the first record, it hadn't been released at that time. He pulled me aside at home and said, "Do you really want this?" And I went, "Yeah, Dad, I really want this." He said, "Okay, you're my son. I want you to therefore be the best that you can be, and be as good as you can at it every time you do it." And those words still ring through my head. Yeah. And I think the word focus is right for me. But when I look back now, <clears throat> and um, it only happened after I'd released the book, so it's not in the book. But when I look back on it now, I can see now why probably I did get this top five album eight consecutive years. Because I haven't given up the love of recording. I haven't gone through that period of saying, oh, I'm bored. Yeah. I just can't wait. I, if I could spend, you know, a week every month in a studio, I'd happily do it. So going back to Desert Island Discs, oh. 
What? <laughs> that was Elvis, wasn't it? Yeah. What has changed this time around? Um, well, I changed. They, first of all, I asked them if I could play uh, a couple of my, uh, my own records. One of them was a duet, because when we talked about it, I said, obviously, my spirituality has meant so much to me in my life. In a desert island, I'd like to sort of nurture that a bit. And I had just made this record with Sheila Walsh, a Scottish singer living now in the States. She's quite big in this sort of gospel TV area. And they asked me if I'd sing this duet with her. And it was a very old hymn. I mean, it sounds like a gospel song now, but I said, I'd like to take that with me. It's about being in a situation that is so bad. In fact, the minister that wrote it in 300 years ago, had him invite to go and speak abroad, maybe England, but he had sent his wife and three daughters, sent them on a boat to get there before him and he would meet them. They all died at sea. He was able to, after that, write a lyric that says, it is well in my soul. And I'm thinking, I want to feel like that when I've got nobody to talk to, I want to say, okay, God, it is well in my soul. So they let me do that. And the other one was, I, I wanted to talk about how you can actually miss out on a hit. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's happened a couple of times to me. And one was one of the biggest hits I could have had around the world. Terry Britton, who wrote Devil Woman for me and a number of other songs, sent a demo to my office. And he said afterwards, he said, I, I was, I'm telling, he, telling me, he said, I was surprised really, he said, because the office just sent it back saying, we don't think it's right for Cliff. And I said, well, I never heard it. And the song was, What's love got to do with it, got to do with it? That was Tina Turner's hit. Yeah. So Tina has obviously got now the classic, you know, the ultimate version of it. And had Terry, had I got it, and, and I would have loved it immediately, he would have forced me to sing it that way too. So what I did now, a couple of years, three or four years later, I was working with Alan Tarney, who wrote We Don't Talk Anymore for me. And uh, he said, what kind of songs would you like to do? It was, it was an album called Wanted. I wanted to have this. I said, I wanted a hit, and I didn't get it. He said, which one? I said, what's love got to do with it? So we did a kind of, a kind of dance version of it, which is quite good. And I said, I love it. So if you don't mind, I'm not taking Tina's. I'd like to take mine. <laughs> <laughs> did, who else did you, besides yourself, to take on the oh, desert yeah. island? Uh, I wanted Bonnie Rayet. Bonnie Rayet. Sing, uh, she sang that beautiful song, um, I can't make you love me if, yeah, if you don't. Yeah. Um, I chose, um, wait a minute now, oh, I ended the show. They wanted to end with Heartbreak Hotel. And I said, no, I have a reason to, to use it at the beginning. And I've got a reason for recommend, for requesting a song called High Water Everywhere by Joe Bonamassa. And this guy is a fantastic blues guitarist. He's got this guttural voice. And in, in, the, in the introduction to it, I was able to say what I felt, that yes, I have been one of the luckiest performers ever. I've had so many hits and I'm going to be remembered for many of them. I'll be remembered for Living Doll. I'll be remembered for uh, The Young Ones and Bachelor Boy and all those fantastic ballads. I'd like to have been remembered to be something like Bonamassa though. I mean, da -da 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 high water everywhere. That's what I was listening to. And that's why the, in the 1960 version of Desert Island Discs, there were black, four black singers. Bertha Kipp was one of them. Uh, I can't remember, Ray Charles was the other, two, two, there was two more. I didn't know that Chuck Berry was black until we saw a photograph later. We just were, were listening to absolutely fantastic rock and roll. You know, America is, nothing can take it away from them. America is the fatherland of rock and roll. It's a blend of all the music that came from there, the jazz, the gospel, blues, all of that. So it's a, it's a place that you have to give credit to, that they are the ones that showed us how to do it. Uh, now, I've seen you play tennis with my son, Simon, who's 45 years of age, uh, and you, sir, are 80 years of age. But when the game is over, Simon walks off the court like a little old man, and you're still oh. bouncing around like Mr. Blobby. Yeah, first of all, I think you're exaggerating a little bit, yeah, because, I mean, the funny thing is I play quite a lot of tennis anyway, and I started doing it because I used to have a bad back. And one specialist said to me, you've got two choices, either immobilize yourself, go to bed, don't wake up again, don't get up, or get more active. So tennis came in. And you know, I found that when I'm playing tennis, even here in Barbados, it's hot. Portugal, I've played in 90 degrees, right there at two till three in the afternoon. And I found that you don't exp expend that much energy in any one song on stage. So it was brilliant for me. My lungs worked better. 
yes, if I'm dancing with dancers, I have to tell the choreographer, please give me time to get some breath so I can actually sing live. Of course. And so I, I have to be careful, but that's why I did tennis. So I play it a lot. And therefore sometimes, um, I don't know whether your Simon plays daily or whatever it is, but if he doesn't, it's going to be tougher for him to keep the pace up. But again, you know, I don't age is easier to deal with if you're if you're healthy. But tell me, is it your diet? What 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 is your diet nowadays? I think it's not a diet; it's a regime. It's a lifestyle for eating, and it, I got it because I had I was having a massage in Dubai, one of those places, and uh, the, the masseuse. She talked a lot, and when, just when I was going to say to her, look, I, I'm falling asleep, she said, oh, I, by the way, I talk a lot. Do you want me to stop? I went, no, you started talking about something I'm interested in, food that's right for the individual. Okay? Right, right, of course. And when the massage was over, she said, do you know your blood type? And I said, well, I think I'm A. And so she brought out this big form, and it had food, thousands of foods that you can eat, loads that are marked beneficial or steer clear of and um, I, I thought well I, I'd never heard of it but she said look even if you don't do it try one thing give up wheat and dairy and so I did and within three months I'd lost an inch around my waist and I thought well if it works in that respect I'll do the whole thing so that's what I do I've got I've got ten no-nos I can't eat wheat or dairy no red meat no crustaceans no mangoes papayas or bananas no potatoes tomato tomatoes tom tomatoes potatoes and aubergine, eggplant. And you know, I used to like a lot of that stuff, but it's only 10 items. I can eat so much. I can eat chicken and turkey. I can eat, I don't know, seven or eight fish, different fish. So it's been a very easy diet. And what the main thing that I can tell you, now it doesn't mean it's gonna work for everybody, but I think people should try it anyway. Find your blood type and stick to it for at least a six month period. I found now, I go on holiday, I don't put on any weight. I still stick with the regime. I still eat as much as everybody else, and uh, and I don't I don't worry about going to the scales every day, which is what I used to do. You obviously had to cancel your 80th anniversary concert at the Royal Albert Hall. Yes. What has been over the years the favourite concert you've ever done, and why? There are there are a few concerts I loved doing because very early on, when the Shadows and I first started, we had no microphones. We, the, well, we used to point the amplifiers up to the furthest part of the, of the venue. Whatever lights the cinema had, we would come on and they'd give me a microphone that looked like a gas mic. And, and it was terrible. Suddenly, we had amplifiers and they were being mic'd and balanced out front and desks that give you all sorts of echoes and anything you wanted. So that made it very enjoyable. Then, as the audiences grew and grew and grew, and suddenly we found we were playing 18 nights at Wem Wembley Arena. I think I still hold the record there. But it means that you have a bigger budget. And so I started using laser lights. Uh, it was the last time I did it. I, I can't remember which tour it was, uh, but my manager came in three weeks into a six week rehearsal. And he said, listen, I've got to tell you, you're three weeks in and you've already spent a quarter of a million pounds. Mm -hmm. But Nigel, because, <laughs> because I had all these fabulous songs and we've got these lights and lasers. I want to think, I was saying, okay, now, in the center of the stage, I want one section of the revolve to go this way and the other one to go in the opposite direction. So I did a duet on there where I, the girl stood on the edge and I was on the inside reaching for her and she'd, we'd pass each other. It was fantastic. So those kind of shows, it wasn't one single show, but those types of shows were the ones I really loved. Now, of course, I'm back to being with my band we are a live band and singer. And it's great fun, I have to say. We still have nice lights, but we don't have as much of the, the waste of cash. Um, before we go, I'd love you to tell me the story about Paul McCartney when he was going into London yeah. and you tried to copy him. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, I'd read a lot about uh, Paul. Paul, Mc Paul used to live in um, St. John's Wood and uh, outskirts of London but and I read that he used to use the, the underground every time he wanted to go into town and apparently one day he was going there and this woman came up to him and said I know who, exactly who you are and he said what do you mean who am I 
She said, Paul McCartney, you're Paul McCartney. He said, Paul McCartney, what would Paul McCartney be doing on a YouTube train? And she went, oh, you're right. And she went away. So now I'm, I'm having trouble getting in from the Woolwich area. Um, it took me once from the center of town to get back two hours. Okay, it was rush hour and it was raining, but two hours to do nine miles was ludicrous. So then I said, well, I'm gonna try the train. And a couple of times I got on the train, I got there, everybody's like this or the, like this. And I always stood with a friend, he'd stand here and I'd hold them back so that I was being covered. Then of course I thought, well, this is ridiculous. Uh, one day we rushed down to the train, the doors just closed. My friend was already there hanging onto a pole and I just got in hanging on the pole and this woman ran in and now she's holding on the same pole and <laughs> looking into each other's eyes. And she says to me, I know who you are. And I'm thinking, Paul McCartney, Paul McCartney. I know who you are. I said, really, who am I? And she said, you're Cliff Richard. I said, oh, please, Cliff Richard. What would I be doing on the tube train? What would I be doing on the tube train? I can't believe it. I can't still, and then she said to me, okay, okay, yeah, thank you. Would you, would you rather go and stand with your friend? Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Cliff, thank you so much for chatting with me today. And on behalf of everybody back in Los Angeles, I'm sure we want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Thank you. And have you got a message for them? Well, I mean, obviously, when Christmas comes around, it's always been my favorite time of the year. I love it. And, and even though in London, sometimes they say they're going to call them holiday lights or something like that, I don't like the idea of that. Christmas is Christmas. It's a sign of peace. Even people that don't believe in God will still let you out in the street if you're going past in a car. People get all very generous and kind. It's the, that moment of, of that year. That's what it's like. And I hope all of you have a wonderful, fantastic, peace-filled Christmas with all the people that you love, I, though I know um, it's going to be much more difficult this year. But again, the vaccine might have started, and, but I nevertheless wish you a fantastic time and a very happy and virus-free New Year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks, Nigel. Good fun, I have to say.